at the end of the day, we want to improve your relationship with technology, right? We know that, yes, it's great to take time off from your screens. You know, I'm a big proponent of that. As I mentioned to you guys, I was living in a yurt in Kyrgyzstan for a week off the grid. Like <laughs> that stuff is really important. We, we definitely advocate for that, but we also recognize that you can't do that every day, right? You have a job that requires screen use. Mm -hmm. You, you know, might be in a long distance relationship and you want to FaceTime, you know, your significant other, you want to watch a basketball game at night or, you know, a Netflix show or whatever that might mean. And so to say, Hey, let's not be in front of screens is not really going to work. It's saying, okay, what are the ways that we can improve that relationship with our technology? Because we are going to use it. Hey, real quick, uh, we're going to give away the Power Bundle right now to one of you lucky viewers. So the Power Bundle includes Maps Strong and Maps Power Lift. They're both three-month programs, both for strength, both for power, both different though, right? So Maps Strong is a strongman-inspired workout program. Power Lift is a power lifter workout program. You can get them both. They normally retail at 300 bucks, but right now we're doing them for $79.99, but one of you is going to get it for free, okay? So you can either sign up for the discount or see if you win and get it for free. Here's how you can enter to win. Uh, leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll give it to you for free. Everybody else, the Power Bundle, again, is $79.99. Lifetime access to both programs. If you just want to sign up, head over to mapsmarch.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. By the way, this is so nice. I haven't done an in-person interview and. In since COVID. So much really? better, bro. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We, it's we been appreciate on like seven virtual ones. When you guys said in person, I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, that's we way better. We appreciate it because there's a lot of things you can't read and see and connect with. A hundred percent. You also video. just like, it's get it's better to get to know every, you know, you, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Did you did you guys see a, a spike in, in sales, in fact, during this like virtual? The very beginning was like bonkers. Mm, really? Yeah, because like everyone just went immediately indoors. They're like, wait, but I'm on Zoom for like 10 hours a day, plus all the time I'm supposed to do stuff. And then I'm watching Netflix at night. And so it just like kind of went crazy. What made you guys decide to do uh, glasses for kids? Because that was a, that was a game changer for my kids. Because yeah. during that period of time, they were at home doing school all day long. Yeah, on their on iPads their all day trying to get their work done. Yeah, yeah. And I could see, I could notice a huge difference when I had them wear the glasses versus when they didn't. They yep. were totally different. Yeah, I mean, basically we just kept hearing from customers like, can we have this for our kids? And we're like, we're going to listen to our customers. So, I and, mean, it, it, it's the same same technology, everything else. And it's like kids are in front of screens just as much as adults are half the time, especially with, you know, remote learning. Well, let's let's get into the, the origin story and how you got here. Because I know you have, you know, you come from parents of what a, a doctor and a nurse so yeah. i'm sure that you were supposed to go on that path right was that what, the direction you were supposed you know my to go? dad did not yeah. want me to be a doctor he wanted me to be a lawyer he's uh, like <laughs> classic yeah. like uh don't do what i do but do this other thing <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah you're really good at arguing yeah, yeah. Uh, this oh. is where you need to go yeah, have Definitely. you seen my malpractice yeah. insurance you, you, yeah. grew up, you grew up in like a new york jewish household you get good at arguing real fast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. so what brought you down down this path then so uh, I actually went to school. I thought I was going to be a lawyer and okay. early on realized like, I don't want to do that. I wanted to build things. And so got excited about that. When I graduated from school in 2013, went to work for um, this fellowship program launched by Andrew Yang called Venture for America. Mm. Basically, it was like Teach for America, but applied to startups, right? So it's a nice segue ease into, hey, how do you get into the startup community? It's not the easiest thing right out of college, generally, because especially startups are looking for people who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. College kids generally don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and so I got introduced to the old CEO of Zappos, Tony Shea, who, you know, unfortunately passed away in 2020 or 2021, but uh, his project to revitalize downtown Las Vegas called Downtown Project. So basically he put in 350 million of his own money into that project. Uh, and it's where Zappos is based. But if you've ever been to downtown Vegas, especially back then, it was really, really seedy. And it was just, how do we build a ton of demand in that area? We were building restaurants and bars and all this cool stuff to get people excited about coming down there and ultimately wanting to live there. Except it was treated like a startup. And so we had no idea if these projects were going to make money or lose money. And my team was like, figure this out. You figure this out. So I'm 
22 years old out of school. No idea uh, what you're doing. <laughs> okay, sure. Like you're leading a team a, yourself. Uh, it's like, you know, you just have to be resourceful, right? So Google your way to victory. And I end up building all these, you know, models in Excel, financial models in Excel. And my eyes just started to absolutely kill me. I'm like, what is going on? And mm. I'm looking around and half the people I know are complaining about the same stuff, right? My eyes are exhausted at the end of the day. I'm getting this nagging headache in the afternoon. My vision might get a little bit blurry. So I start talking to optometrists and ophthalmologists. I'm like, what is going on here? What, why, why, do I, why am I and so many people I know complaining about similar issues? And many of them are saying, look, a lot of this has to do with what screens produce, blue light and glare. And if you could filter blue light, which is high energy light that comes off of <clears throat> any screen today, and glare, which is typical of any screen as well, if you could filter blue light, eliminate glare, you can create this more comfortable experience. And so I'm like, okay, cool. That sounds great. I want to I wanna buy a pair. Except that at the time, it was either, which is still true today, these clear lenses that don't really work very well, or these yellow lenses yeah. that are in these hunting goggly type frames yeah. that you put them on, you look like one of the X-Men. Yeah. That's I'm what like, I remember from the 80s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They had those commercials with these big, ugly orange glasses. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. I'm like, all right, look, I wear a t-shirt or button down to work. I'm not wearing a suit, but I still care about the way that I look. And I think that it's important. And so when we were creating Felix Gray, it was this idea of how do you combine function with fashion, right? So how do you create something that your eyes are going to feel good, but you're going to feel good and confident in what you're wearing at the same time? And so we ended up building this proprietary way of filtering blue light. It is 15 times more effective than other clear lenses. And then it's housed in just really beautiful frames. So, you know, that was kind of how it all got rolling. And we had no idea if this was going to work, right? Uh, no one even knew what blue light was at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What year is this right now? What year are we in right now when we were talking about this? Yeah. So uh, join this, you know, Tony's thing in 2013. By yep. 2015, I had left to go start this. Uh, by 2016, we had the first product in our hands. And so instead of just launching, and this is when direct-to-consumer, a lot of different brands were launching. They're raising tons of money, pre-revenue, and you know, we thought, uh, okay, we can do this ourselves. And my co-founder and I, you know, Chris and myself, were like, look, we're two smart guys. We we could kind of raise a bunch of money too. And people just laughed us out of the room. They're like, you're not going to change behavior, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to sell glasses to people who, especially at the time, we were just selling non-prescription, mm -hmm. right? So now we sell prescription, we sell readers, we have a kid's line. We have a lot of different stuff. But at the time, it was just people for who either had 2020 vision like myself or who, you know, wear contacts and people just, they're like, that's not going to happen. So we said, okay, well, we still think this is, can be real. There's enough people we know that are complaining about these issues. So we started going all around New York and working with companies like Uber and Barclays and LinkedIn. And we would go into their offices and we'd offer them a 50 pair trial period for their employees. So just, smart. Just a free thing yeah. to do. Right. And their culture HR teams are super happy because we handled the whole thing. They didn't have to do anything and they got to offer a perk to employees. And at the end, those employees could either purchase out of their own pocket or they could return them. And we come, we didn't even, the website, you know, fully launched and everything. So we'd actually be carrying duffel bags around the subway with eyewear, just, you know, wow. going in and out. And we saw that about one in three people were buying at the end of those two weeks and they, they, they loved it. And what was funny is then we would come back, you know, to the office on Monday and we'd have emails Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from a bunch of people who had returned them saying, hey, can you actually come back to the office? I'm wearing, I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, doing my work without these and I'm noticing, you know, how, how, how much worse my eyes are than they were when I was wearing So them that was eyes. my experience was oh. when I first used them, I couldn't really tell until I didn't use them. I think that's what happens to a lot of people is like, it's it's subtle enough of a difference that you're like, oh, is this helping? Is this not helping? And then it's not until you stop using them consistently then all of a sudden that you you notice. Yeah, that. I don't know yeah. if you know uh, our story, but we were super skeptical of any blue light blocking anything early days. In fact, we made fun of the orange and yellow glasses and 
you know, we, we said it was like the, well, yeah. Cause it was in the biohacking sort of space and you, it, they were into everything that looked ridiculous. Yes. And yeah. They were cool about it. And then, and then when we met you guys and we wore them, um, then we were sold because we could tell a big difference. Well, I also, I read a book in 2017 or early 2018, um, by Adam Alter. And I talked about it on the podcast a bunch of time called irresistible, and the book is basically about just the addictive properties of tech and like what's happened in the last decade. So, and at that time I had a different kid that was working for us that was helping me look for like partnerships in companies. And that said, like, I knew that where we were heading with the addiction to tech, that probably wasn't going to change. I think it was just going to get more and more at a younger, younger age. And there has to be some unintended consequences of us being glued to screens all day long. So I was like, there's got to be something that is going to be in the future coming out to help combat that so on. And that was blue light blocking glasses. And it was you guys who were kind of, and that was still, I know, pretty early for you guys, but you were some of the first, you know, websites and stuff that popped up and social media. I saw you back then. And that's what had it made us head towards yeah. you guys was where well, you guys looked like you were leading the way in the space. Yeah. We, and it's funny you mentioned that. So, you know, we, you know, really did pioneer the, the new wave of blue light glasses, um, but for us, you know, at our core, we never started a company to start an eyewear company, right? We started because we we're dealing with these issues. And so when you're talking about the negative effects of digital devices, that is the larger mission of Felix Gray at this point, right? So we are in the midst of our transition from a direct to consumer blue light glasses brand where, you know, we basically sold all through our site our blue light glasses products to now being an omni-channel digital wellness brand. And what that means is one, we're starting to launch with different partners, right? So we're about to launch a diffused product line with Target at the end of March. Um, we're launching in 500 Best Buy stores, uh, you know, later in the summer. But digital wellness to us is even more important. It's this idea of, at the end of the day, we want to improve your relationship with technology, right? We know that, yes, it's great to take time off from your screens. You know, I'm a big proponent of that. As I mentioned to you guys, I was living in a yurt in Kyrgyzstan for a week off the grid, like, <laughs> That stuff is really important. We we definitely advocate for that, but we also recognize that you can't do that every day, right? You have a job that requires screen use. Mm -hmm. You you know might be in a long distance relationship, and you want to Facetime, you know, your significant other. You want to watch a basketball game at night, or you know, a Netflix show, or whatever that might mean. And so to say, hey, let's not be in front of screens is not really going to work. It's saying, okay, what are the ways that we can improve that relationship with our technology because we are going to use it. Now we kind of glossed over a bit about um, you know the the trials and and um, you know the process of you actually trying to develop a better lens uh, and you know how do you even approach that and like how so I know too like isn't there like one company in Italy Luxotica that that sort of dominates a lot of the frame space as well um, and just can you like paint the picture of of what that all looks like getting into the eyewear. Uh, sort of business? Yeah, it's a great question. So I came, I had no experience um, and, you know, did not have any family background or anything in the area. So it really just became hustling and networking and just meeting one person that mm -hmm. knew another person that knew another person and selling the mission, selling the vision and really just, you know, following up with people, <clears throat> being a good person, being a kind person, being appreciative of their time and showing those traits. And so that meant that with one good conversation, someone introduced me to another person and that ended up leading us to our lens supplier and we developed a proprietary lens with them. So we realized that, hey, these guys are the best in the business, but what they're doing isn't totally what we think the market should need. And we worked with them on a new formula. And essentially that is what allows us to be this clear lens, like what I'm wearing right now, looks like a normal pair of glasses, but it's filtering, you know, 30% of blue light, you know, where most blue light is created. It's filtering 90% of the highest energy wavelengths, but it's also filtering a really high percentage of like where most screens are producing blue light. And if you look at other clear products, they're also going to filter that high range, <clears throat> but where most blue light is produced is a little bit further down in the spectrum. You usually need color in order to filter that level. And so those other products are only filtering like two to 3% of blue light. Mm. And so you'll see a lot of customers saying, hey, I, I found Felix Gray because I tried two other pairs. I didn't really love them, mm -hmm. but my eyes were killing me. I was looking for a solution. I finally pulled the trigger on the more expensive product. 
and it really is you get what you pay for. Yeah. Was that a, a tough process? Because uh, I guess, I don't know, for lack of a better term, dumb tech would be we you, you look at something through a, a different color. So red lenses obviously are going to block everything but red light. Orange, everything but, you know, uh, orange or whatever goes through orange. But clear, that's really tough. Like, how do you block blue light without changing the color of what you see? It almost sounds impossible. Like, what did that process look like? So the the secret at the end of the day is we took a, basically around age 40, we start developing in a very trace quantity, a pigment in our eye that can filter blue light. But it exists so small that it's not really going to do anything for us without extra support. And so we synthesized that pigment put it into the lens and then added a few other properties that turn that that property is still a little bit yellow but it's not as yellow as like a yellow or orange as what you would mm -hmm. normally see from a really good blue le blue light lens and so what we did is we then add a couple other properties that turn that yellow back into clear so you still have that pigment in there that's filtering oh. blue light but then have a couple other things to make it so the lens appears clear oh really interesting now how does this differ than the, you know, the, how I can change the screen on my phone that'll reduce or stop blue light or on my computer screen? Yeah. So that's totally a misnomer. So like night shift, I think is what you're referring yeah. to. So that's really good about changing the contrast of your screen, right? So if you're, you know, everyone knows you're, you're, you're up at night and then you look at your phone and it's that <clears throat> white light, you know, hitting and it's the contrast is a lot with a dark room and it's annoying to your eyes that's going to be annoying. And so basically what night shift is doing, it's changing the temperature of your screen. But if you think about blue light, I mean, anything that is going to have white light in it essentially has to have RGB. It has to have red, green, and blue. So unless your screen is completely red and black, you have to have blue light. Hmm. So you're not going to affect that at all. And then just as importantly, you know, people know it as blue light glasses, but a really effective pair of blue light glasses also needs to be able to eliminate glare, right? That's another important aspect, right? When you get that distracting glow, you're able, basically it's the light coming in from a variety of different areas into your eye. And so an anti-glare and anti-reflective coating is going to take all that light and it's going to put it into one part of your, it's going to enter the lens and then it's going to essentially the angles that <coughs> all converge. And so it enters, the light enters your eye at one focal point. Mm. And so that's going to be a lot more comfortable for your eye too. So now something that was interesting to me was uh, as we dived in deep or as I, I did in the science of this is that there's actually some benefit to blue light as well, right? It's uh, it's wakefulness properties. So maybe you can explain the difference between day, bl you know, blue light blocking glasses and night blue light blocking glasses. Cause I notice a difference. If I wear the night ones, during the day, I get sleepy. Mm. Um, so maybe explain that a little bit. Yeah. So blue light, if it essentially it, it is one of the things that helps with our circadian rhythm. So when we were like cavemen, cave women, you know, you think about it. Okay, you get out of your cave. Now the sun's come up. Okay, you go about your day, try not to get killed by you know some animal, and then you know maybe you hunt something or you gather something, and then you go back to your cave. It's dark. Melatonin starts to be secreted because there's an absence of, you know, blue light. You go to sleep, sun rises, same thing happens again. Um, what's important with what we do is that we filter blue light. We don't block blue light. So our clear lens is something that's still going to allow blue light into your eye. It's important. It's monitor. It's, it's helping manage your circadian rhythm. It's not going to block it fully. We actually have a sleep product that's specially designed to filter even more blue light and that's what improves melatonin secretion by two times. So like our clear lens, some people wear it at night and they they really see an improvement. But what we really recommend is, hey, wear your clear lenses during the day and then wear our amber lenses for sleep at night because that's going to be more helpful. Yeah, I do that uh, like two hours before bed. Is that yeah. how you guys recommend it? I do it like four hours, but I also have like, I go to bed at one in the morning usually. Mm, so that's oh. like my time to like, get stuff done, you know, yeah, or, you yeah. know, but now I know, I know we have studies that show the difference in melatonin production from doing this. And it's pretty significant. Do we see any other, uh, hormones being affected? I would assume growth hormone because melatonin and growth hormone are somewhat related. I think that anything that I can't speak to that so directly, but I will say that anything that is going to be affected by melatonin, any other hormones are surely then going to be affected, right? Because if your melatonin isn't being secreted because you've essentially brought 
the sunlight indoors mm -hmm. with your digital devices, then and you know, then you won't have melatonin flowing through your body, and that's gonna affect other hormones at the same mm -hmm. time. So here's something interesting. This is not, and I, I do, I want a disclaimer here. I haven't seen any studies on this, but this is just my own uh, experience. So we've been w working with a company that has these continual glucose monitors, and uh, we haven't yet talked about them because we were testing out the product. But nonetheless, what it allows you to do is see what your glucose levels look like throughout the day, and then you can adjust your nutrition. You know, white rice affects me more than, you know, oatmeal or vice versa or whatever. And I noticed a difference in my glucose from wearing blue light blocking glasses versus not. And I asked the nutritionist that's associated with the uh, glucometer, and she said melatonin production actually has an effect on glucose. So very, very interesting. So I'm interested to see further science in some of the stuff and seeing how it affects uh, chronic disease, for example, because we know that poor sleep is connected to higher rates of diabetes, dementia, low testosterone in men, you know, fertility issues. I mean, you name it. Yep. So I'm sure we're going to see in the future um, how connections much, to more things. How much research is being done right now on blue light blocking? I mean, what what is what has been like the evolution of that? So blue light essentially at this point, a Harvard study came out in 2009 that really opened the, the doors to hey, blue light suppresses melatonin secretion. At this time, that's become really common fact. The most research that's being done right now and is in, are there long-term negative effects associated mm. with blue light? And so that is, you're seeing an increase in age-related macular degeneration. So the macula is part of the retina. If that degenerates, essentially <clears throat> leads to blindness. And so there is an increase in that. And some models show within stem cells and animals, animal cell models that an overexposure to blue light can harm the retina and essentially deteriorate it, deteriorate the macula. Others say that, hey, that overexposure is more than you're going to get from screens. And so we're still in the early days, but I kind of liken it to the fact that for hundreds of years, we had no idea if smoking was bad for us or not. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, mm -hmm. and then there was about 50 years where the cigarette companies were just kind of saying, no, it's not bad for you, but we all kind of knew it was bad for us. Uh, we're in the really, really early days of this, right? We're the first generation that's in front of devices all day, every day, totally. dealing with this stuff. And so I think it's going to take a while to really figure that out. But what I will say is, and we have customers that reach out about this all the time, it's not bad to wear a pair of blue light glasses. There's no harm associated. So if you're treating this as an insurance policy, that's totally okay. There's no going to be harm coming from that. Yeah. The way I, the way I say it is um, try it and see if you feel better. And the answer is typically yes, I do feel a lot better. So. And I think the last thing, which is the most subjective aspect, which is more difficult to do in a scientific study is around pain, yeah. right? Because how do you judge someone's eye strain mm. versus someone else's eye strain, right? Uh, and so those things, a lot of times we collect our own data. So we know, for instance, that um, 90 days after customers buy a pair of Felix Grays, whether they've returned them or not, we ask them, hey, <laughs> Did you experience symptoms related to digital eye strain? So eye strain, eye fatigue, dry eyes, blurry vision, headaches. Did you experience these symptoms before wearing Felix Grey? And nine out of 10 people say yes. That matches up with the fact that when people first purchase, nine out of 10 people say, yeah, I'm buying this because I'm dealing mm. with these issues. Mm. And then as a follow-up to that, we say, okay, if you were dealing with these issues, have you experienced a significant improvement from wearing Felix Grey? Nine of 10 of which people say, yes, I've experienced wow, a significant huge. improvement. So we're kind of the same way, Sal. We're like, hey, look, try it. If you don't like it, it's not for you. That's fine. That's why we have a 30-day return policy for a reason. You know, We want you to sit with the product. We want you to enjoy it. And if you don't, there's not going to be any questions. You're gonna, We're going to take it right back because we're so confident in the product that it works. What's the projected growth of the space in general of uh, you know this kind of market? It's supposed to be 10% of the eyewear market in the next five years. Mm -hmm. so, what is it right now? Uh, about 3% of the about eyewear three. market. Oh, wow. That's huge. So triple yeah. its it size in the next how many years? In the next five. Now, do you agree with that or do you think that's going to grow even faster? Because I, I feel like um, the awareness of – like, okay, one thing you said that was really important is you would have people try them and then they would notice a difference. And I found that to be mm -hmm. true with lots of different things that people just don't know because they don't know. So do you think that that's accurate? Or do you think it's going to be a faster growth than that? I think growing three times in five years over the whole market is still like really fast. I think that it could definitely grow faster. 
The area where it's going to grow the fastest though is then going to be, and what we're trying to work on right now is like we have a prescription line, right? And mm -hmm. so it's the same lens. It's just offered in your prescription product. Yeah, and you're already wearing glasses. So convincing why that. would why would you not, if you're a glasses wearer, then do that? And right. so now we're we're figuring out ways of saying, hey, you might <clears> like <throat> your Prada frame, but you want that Felix Gray lens in it. How do we do that? Yeah. Mm. Right. So that we're not tied to our frame constraints and saying, oh, I, I love the Nash frame, even though the Nash frame is a great frame, or like the Harrow frame is a great <coughs> frame, but you might like this or that or this brand or that brand. But you know that, hey, I do require, like, I am in front of a screen, like, between my phone, my laptop, my monitor, my TV, like yeah. 10 hours a day. I would love to use the best product in class. So I think that that's where you're going to see even further growth. So are, are you, is that in the near is future where you're going to be able to have a pair of Paradas and have the Felix Grey lenses in them? We're, we're working through it right oh, now. Oh, wow. Okay. wow that's that could be, that could be huge. Now, what about the gamer market? Have you guys looked at that? Cause uh, we had a, um, a friend of ours, uh, Mark Masteroff on the show. He's a founder of 24 fitness, like a godfather in the fitness space, but he's investing heavily in these, these like, e-gaming, you know, sports uh, spaces, which I had no idea they were as big and as, uh, as generate as much revenue as they do. And they're projected to just explode. And we, I think they're going to, they're going to bigger than conventional sports. Yeah. It's they're going to bigger than conventional sports. It's crazy. Yeah. Are you guys yeah. looking in that space as well? So we already work in that space a little bit less so than, you know, our primary bread and butter is definitely more on the professional side, but we definitely are getting further and further into the gaming side, especially because, you know, if you think about what a gamer, a typical gamer <clears throat> stereotype looked like 30 years ago versus today, yeah. it's totally different, totally. right? Like everyone games yeah. now, you know, back then it was very different. And so everyone games and most of these people are live streaming this stuff, yeah. right? And so they want to look good in the process too. So they want mm -hmm. something that works, but they're also going to look good. Felix Gray makes a lot of sense. Have you, you got, got into that more? Are you guys like do any, any influencers that are pushing Felix Gray right now in the streaming some, side? We've done some influencers that that are gamers that push Felix Gray. I can't remember the ones off the top of my head because the marketing team tends to handle that stuff. Yeah, but we've done that. Uh, at times, we sponsor different like actual esports like teams. Mm. So we've definitely gone into that space. It's still, again, like I say, it's definitely not like the bread and butter right now, but it's kind of the same value prop for someone who might be like a banker or a lawyer, you know, a startup guy, a tech person, you know, being in front of their screen all day for work and then going home and playing video games. It's the same value prop. Yeah. Dave, because uh, in, in my opinion, much of this is driven by the science that's coming out to show the benefits that gets people open to even try them. Are you guys funding studies yourselves to get more awareness around the benefits. So we're really adamant about if we fund studies, it comes with a little bit of a, hey, what was what the real result going to actually look like? Mm. So what we care about is one, we collect and do our studies on our own customer data. So that's really important, right? So for instance, like I mentioned, like the nine to 10 people yeah. see significant improvement. And, you know, that's, you know, tens of thousands of data points from, you know, survey data at this point. And then there's a lot of other studies being done that kind of support that. And it we just, we know what the science is. And then when you see independent studies come out talking through these things, it becomes a lot more impactful than if it's the Felix Gray sponsored study. Um, and at the same time, then we do a lot of our own research and data into our own lenses to making sure that that is really helpful. So we do a lot of filtration curve analysis. Mm. We do a lot of, you know, side-by-side -side comparisons. You know, a lot of these lenses are coatings that are deflecting blue light, or they're putting in a dye into the lens that's only filtering a certain percentage of blue light. So we do a lot of those studies and we walk customers through a lot of that stuff in order to better educate them. Because frankly, you know, when we started, there's a lot of, you know, let's be honest, there's, there's definitely like a snake oil aspect to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this product. And so for us, it's been really important as we've grown. And I think one of the reasons we have grown is because one of our credos is to build thoughtfully designed research back products, right? We're not going to launch something if we don't think that it's going to be effective. We're not going to launch something if the research doesn't show, hey, this is accurate and this is why it's effective. Who are your biggest critics with, uh, with what you guys do? Um, I think that there are some optometrists and ophthalmologists that are, you know, still on the sidelines on this one, but so many people have come over. 
uh, it's very different. Than Probably it was. just because it's so young. We're so early. It was so early, and it's 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 five years ago is very different than it was mm. today. You know, blue light is very well accepted in the mainstream. It is a term that many people know about. That's mm-hmm. very different than it was when we were doing those trial off. You know, when we we're doing those trials in in those companies. No one knew what blue light was. Like not yeah. only they didn't not only know what Felix Gray was, they didn't know what blue light was. They yeah, just yeah. knew that this was helping. Well, I imagine that uh, there has to be some percentage of people that are just like stoked that they have a reason to wear glasses now, right? Like they so, can accessorize. It's hilarious and have to an say excuse that. For it, that's that's the ten percent, right? Mm-hmm. So when we first ask customers, we say, "Do you know why did you buy Felix Gray?" And we give a bunch of different reasons, and nine out of ten of them are buying for some or multiple reasons related to digital eye strain, right? That again, that eye strain, that eye fatigue, dry eyes, blurry vision, headaches, but fashion is like 10% of people are like, I'm buying for fashion reasons. Mm. That's okay. That's totally cool. Yeah. Um, but the overwhelming majority of people are buying it for the lens first and then the frame second, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think if we had a you know terrible looking frame selection, they're never going to check out from Felix Gray, but they're coming for the lens first and then they're leaving with the whole package. And that's why they're really happy. Now, did you predict that? Did you, did you see that happening? I mean, I know you're an NBA fan and I know that like, you know, just like in the last yeah. decade that became like a popular thing where like NBA players would be wearing these, like you're thinking style first, which yeah, clear, I clear glasses, you know, yeah. we were definitely thinking no one is, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. I wouldn't have started Felix gray if there was a really effective and nice looking pair of blue light glasses, right? I, they were hunting goggly looking yeah. stuff and there yeah, were these dude. lenses that didn't work. It was like, all right, something's kind of got to be in between. And, you, but yeah, you're right. Like, you know, Russell Westbrook, classic example, wearing those, you know, glasses that are, you know, fake. Yeah. Um, it definitely was something that I think was a tailwind for us. But I think the larger tailwind was the fact that everyone's just in front of screens so much time and, they're kind of blowing their their brains out a little bit, saying, "Hey, this is killing me." Has there been any sort of influential, like, uh, like player, for instance, or just like celebrity or somebody who's really sort of, you know, brought Felix Gray's even more in the forefront? So we've had some. Um, like Brie Larson is aware of Felix Gray, the the actress. Um, we when we work with when we're trying to figure out celebrity type things, so it's really important for us to be authentic about mm-hmm. it, right? So we still haven't done that celebrity endorsement because, all right, you're an actor, you're acting, you yeah. know, and you're then you're attending, all day long. you're not sitting, you're, you're not like me, you're not like, you, you know, right, you're, right. you know, and so we want it to be authentic. So I think maybe down the line, maybe really cool to be wor- work with a, a well-known director who does, you know, finish with their, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. film and then they're in post production for the next year yeah. in front of a screen all day every day. Where it has function but, with it, not just, hey, look at me. Exactly. But if it's not going to be authentic, then it's not going to feel right and consumers aren't stupid. They're going to look at this and say, why does, you know, Timothy Chalamet need to wear a pair of Felix Grays? He's just <laughs> yeah. acting on a big screen all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get Spielberg. What's been the biggest yeah. uh, what's been the biggest challenge with the company? I think that one of the biggest things for us has been we've created a really good product. And so a lot of people will buy a pair of Felix Grays. They love their pair of Felix Grays. But the reason to come back and buy a second pair is not the most important, right? Because now they have that that pair. Maybe they buy another one for they buy one for their office, they buy one for work. We have a lot of reader customers. Readers customers wear them all over the house, or they might be a you know, a dad or a mom that buys for their kids. But you have plenty of like, 25, 28 year olds, you know, living by themselves or with roommates in a house, they buy that one One pair and they're done. And so I think that, you know, we then said, okay, how do we address that in an authentic way to the brand? And that is a really important aspect to being a digital wellness brand, because it means that our product line gets to go beyond just eyewear. And so, you know, we Mm -hmm. launched a supplement back in August, specifically designed really for potential long-term effects of eye health, right? So it has lutein and zeaxanthin and zinc and vitamin C and E, all things that are found in like AREDS and other really well-known studies that are supposed to support your macular health. We're launching eye drops um, later this year, specifically designed with the fact that a lot of dry eye is related to reduced blink rate. So we Mm. can't fully solve that with a pair of glasses. And so we can continue to solve that 
with a pair of eye drops at the same time. So I think that's really exciting for us because we look at digital wellness and improving that relationship between us and our technology. We kind of look at four key buckets. We look at our eyes, which we clearly do a lot of already. That's either you know short-term comfort or long-term health. We look at sleep, which we've talked a lot about. We also look about your ergonomics and the fact that you're sitting generally at a desk all day. That's affecting your wrist, your neck, your back, things like that. And then we think of, again, you're just your general energy and productivity. A lot of people are using this as a workplace productivity tool. And so how do we look at those four buckets and where are the white spaces within those categories that we can add value to customers? And so I think the longer term vision becomes really exciting because then you can start telling a larger, more important you know, story to customers beyond just blue light glasses, but it's this idea of, hey, just like 20 years ago where, and you look at 20 years ago versus now and the amount of care we have for the food we put into our bodies and the type of exercise we get, the type of sleep we get. Well, then we sit in front of our you know desk for 10 hours a day, mm -hmm. go sit on the couch, watch some TV. We know that's not good for us. Yeah. And so how do we apply that same level of health and wellness to that part of our day, which is such an overwhelming amount of time? And we think of that those four key buckets around your eyes, your sleep, your ergonomics, your energy as areas that you know we can really help customers with. Now, David, statistically speaking, most startups fail um, and founders. What, what gives you confidence in yourself? So, I mean, we've been doing this for a while. So I, I would say that you know, most startups fail. They definitely fail generally early on rather than later on, though they certainly do fail you know, later on as well. I think humility is really important. Um, I recognize that this is still something that is newer. It's a newer market. It's still a younger company. And you need to approach that with, hey, it's not an I can't fail attitude. It's a, hey, I can fail. And here's all the things I'm going to do to avoid failing. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is something that if you have, you're more likely to be successful. And, you, and it just provides a lot of fight in you. Yeah. Um, when something, you know, startups go up and down uh, 100%. And it's really easy when you're down to be like, oh, this sucks. Like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Or, oh, there's no way out. That's, you know, if I've ever thought like that, immediately I'm like, that is a bad attitude to have. Like, it, of course, those thoughts can enter into your mind, but you can't let them, you know, stay there and seep there. You have to say, okay, mm -hmm. What are the ways that we got to approach this challenge with excitement and saying, okay, how do you, how do you solve for this? Yeah. And that has allowed us to, you know, continue to grow and, you know, continue to become, you know, the brand that we are today. Was there a, a turning point or a very pivotal moment in the business where you kind of was like, okay, we definitely have something here, or you knew that it was going to be successful? Frankly, early on it happened. Uh, I think we found product market <clears throat> fit earlier than a lot of companies necessarily do. So when, we, so after these try on programs, one of the groups actually that tried the, the, the product was uh, a business insider team that writes about new products and they loved it. And they kept them being like, we want to write about this. We want to write about this. And we're like, we're not ready yet. You guys write about this. Who knows what happens? And finally, uh, I actually was at lunch with, if you guys know, do you guys know the pasta company Bonza? Hmm. They, you guys would love them. They're like chickpea pasta. Okay. So okay. much more I like healthy. Everybody looked at me when you said pasta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely a pasta guy. Uh, so I was I was having lunch uh, with the, the founder there, who's a friend through this Venture for America network. And Chris, my co-founder, texted me. was like, you got to come back. Because the article had just dropped and sales were just spiking. And all of a sudden, within like two weeks, we were sold out of stock. Oh, wow. And we you know, then said, okay, like we have something how do we continue to scale this? And then as we started to scale it, we continue to see success as we got stock back in the door. And so those were some of the things that were, we found that product market fit really early, which yeah. was which was pretty promising. Mm. Scariest moment? Scariest moment. Uh, there's been a few. I remember one time earlier on, we didn't do our like inventory modeling the right way. And so we weren't expecting that the packages couldn't be reused at the same rate as other things. So we're really 
keen about, okay, we don't want to just throw away stuff. We don't want to waste stuff. And mm. so when people return something like a pair of glasses, we actually now have a facility in Ohio that will do full QC on it. And if it's not up to standard, you know, we'll actually donate it. But if it is up to standard, we can reuse it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want it, we don't want it to go to waste from both a, a green aspect and also from a financial aspect. And so, and you know, the customer is still going to be really happy with the product because it's fully QC'd, it's a hundred percent. But earlier on, you know, for packaging, you can't do that. You're going to have to unfortunately throw away most of that packaging. And so we had like no boxes for like three weeks and we couldn't ship out product. We had all these frames and you know, we had all these glasses sitting there, sales rolling through. And we had to explain to a lot of customers, hey, your order is going to be delayed because of a packaging issue. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 was yeah. definitely, uh, that was definitely one that, that sucked. I actually was headed to a basketball game that night. I was going to play basketball. And my VP ops called me. and was like, we have a problem. I was yeah, like, I'm going to come back to the office. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I, this might be a tough question to ask, but do you have uh, like a long-term strategy for yourself uh, with the company? Like when you would want to sell or exit or company goes public or do you, is that anything or even step down and allow company. someone else to run? Like what's your vision? So right now, I mean, my, from, for my position, I still think I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm having a lot of fun. I think what's awesome of being a CEO is you get to constantly be improving yourself every day and focusing on, you know, how, how to become a better leader, how to become a better listener. And so I, I'm really confident in staying in that role and continuing this really exciting time again, to becoming this digital wellness brand and growing beyond the really strong reputation we've built in the blue light glasses space. I think that in terms of M&A and all those things, we're first and foremost focused on building an awesome company. All that stuff will come when it comes. Mm. Um, if we build a great company that customers love, <clears throat> that a P&L looks good at the same time, you know, that all will, will work itself out. But Right now, we're just really focused on on telling this this story around digital wellness that we don't think any brand is telling, yeah. and we think it's a really important one to be told. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a big risk because you're going from blue light blocking glasses to now. It sounds like you want to be one of the, the at the forefront of educating people on just wellness yeah. in in the digital space. What about your style of of leadership? Or do you do you try and model your your leadership around somebody else that's in, in, inspired you or So, I'll answer both both questions. So, the the first thing um so can you repeat what Yeah, you're no problem. Um uh, no, it, it, a big risk because you you're you're selling blue light blocking glasses, they're fashionable, they work, they're good. And now you're like, we want to be the leaders in this in this kind of digital wellness uh, space, which there really aren't that many leaders or, or none that I can think of. So I think maybe it's just like chutzpah, but we have the confidence because we also pioneered the blue light glasses space when no one knew what that was. And we were educating right. on that as well. And I think actually when you phrase it as, hey, let's improve the relationship we have with our technology – kind of clicks for a lot of people. People start nodding along the same way that it used to be when we would say, hey, are your eyes killing you from being in front of a screen all day? And people, it would click as well. But this is a more aspirational mission, I think, than just being at the blue light glass level, even though, look, what we do with blue light glasses is incredibly important. And we're not giving that up by any means. We just think we're telling a larger story. And then in terms of leadership, uh, you know, I look to a lot of different people that I know personally and, and their leadership styles. I look to our own, you know, the own people at the company and, you know, their leadership styles, because I love about what someone does with their team or someone does with their, their team. And then in terms of great CEOs, I think the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella is incredibly mm -hmm. underrated, particularly his idea of, I mean, when he took over Microsoft for 20 years was really, really political. They were, and because they were really political and there's a lot of infighting and a lot of me, 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 there was a lot of stagnation in their growth. They had all this opportunity, a huge platform, and they weren't able to capitalize on all of it. And he came in and really preached this idea of growth mindset. And it's this idea of what we, what I kind of mentioned earlier, which is you have a challenge, be excited about that challenge, right? And it's this idea of, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a problem. Let's not treat it as it's a problem we're going to fail, but, it, oh, this is a challenge that we get to solve. And let me not just solve it by myself, but let me solve it with other people. And, you know, at a big company like theirs, 
That then changes their incentive structures in terms of, <clears throat> hey, you're now evaluated in terms of not what your specifically necessarily your output is providing, but also how your team's output is and how you're helping other teams. And so that type of thinking kind of transformed Microsoft. And I have friends inside Microsoft that have talked about it. And now you look at, you know, their stock price, you know, since he's taken over, yeah. mm -hmm. it's gone through the roof, right? Yeah. Because they had all this opportunity and they just weren't capitalizing on it. And I think he is just a really thoughtful, seems like a great listener first type of person, which is naturally what I'm not like, but what I strive <laughs> to be. Um, and he's just like a really good inspiration. I have kind of a random question. Um, before the podcast started, we were kind of talking about like how all these commercials and how jingles and, and cartoons, all these things that, you know, I paid attention to uh, for some reason now is relevant in my job. Like I can, I can talk <laughs> about these things. I had no idea this would have any kind of relevance with what I do now. And if you kind of look back uh, you know, in terms of like high school, college, you know, just like your own like childhood experience. Is there like any unique traits, personality traits, any kind of skills and things you never would have thought you're using now uh, in your job? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think that, you know, I was on, so I, I played sports, but I also was a little bit of a nerd. So like I was on the debate team and things like that. And I I actually think that stuff has been incredibly important because as a leader, one of the most important things is to communicate. And so I didn't realize how, effect look, I'm not arguing necessarily. I'm not debating everyone all day. That would be exhausting. But it's important to communicate really concisely, coherently, and aspirationally. And I think I learned some of those things from things like debate camp. And my my father, who's like not a sports guy at all, like kind of hates sports. And he would force me to go to like debate camp during the summer. I'd be like, hmm. I want to play like baseball. I, yeah. <laughs> I want to play basketball. <laughs> like, no, 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 you have to go to like debate camp. And like that sucked like, at thanks, the time. Dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was awful. Awful. Yeah. Like I, but I do think it helped, uh, you know, in terms of me and my ability to communicate, which I think is one of the, you know, one of those things that I didn't think was going to be important. And oh, yeah. here I am being like, all right, I guess like, thanks dad, just a little bit, but one it would be nice to play basketball yeah, too. <laughs> in my opinion, one of the most underrated skills is, is actually learning how to debate effectively and properly versus what a lot of people do. And you said you went to school to be a lawyer, so I'm sure they talk about this as well, which is I'm just trying to argue rather than I'm trying to change people's minds. Yeah. And I think that what is the, one of the things I'm really happy that I you know, wasn't a lawyer is because you don't have to change the other side's minds in a, in a law room, right? You have to change the jury's mind. Yes. Here, you have to change someone in business. You have to change someone else's mind, which means you have to approach it first from an empathetic point of view. You're trying to understand where they're coming from and then try to explain where you're coming from. And I think that is really effective. And that means like becoming a good listener and things like that. Whereas if you're a lawyer, you don't really have to worry about those things. My wife actually talks about it all the time. She's like, I'm so happy you weren't a lawyer. She's <laughs> <laughs> like, you'd be such an ass. Yeah. Now, how, how do the, now, how do the parents feel? I mean, that you started to go that direction and then er, you take a ride. Yeah, how do and, they feel at first? And uh, how do they feel now? Yeah. Well, you know, moms are always going to be supportive <clears throat> and moms are the best. Uh, yeah. uh, my mom was always supportive the whole way. My dad was definitely a little bit more skeptical. Is he still now? I mean, where's he at now? Uh, you know, my dad is, I think he's, he's, he's really proud. I know. I think he kind of looks at it and he's like, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And my son's doing that. And that's really cool. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. So in debate camp, did you have to learn how to argue both sides of a, of an argument? Not only both sides, yeah. but there's different styles of debate yeah. and like you have to learn these different that's formats. Cool. So you must yeah. get so Is annoyed. Like medals for uh, winning or what? I definitely like? want to, I, I never got any medal. I, oh, I got trophies though. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. There's trophies. So you yeah. must get so annoyed with the current state of social media and how people just don't like, there's no debate <laughs> skills whatsoever. It's so, I mean, but that's when you're like, you know, posting from, you know, a basement, you know, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. anonymous six, nine, six, nine yeah. is yeah. arguing, you know, versus the other guy. It's yeah. like, oh, it's ridiculous. so Wait, frustrating. Did you come up with the name Felix Gray, by the way? And what is that? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we name all the frames after scientists and mathematicians. Oh, you know? okay. so well, I didn't know that. yeah, which is really cool. Like I'm wearing the Harrow that's named after Guillermo Harrow, who is a Mexican astronomer. Mm. And so 
Felix comes from uh, a Kurt Vonnegut book, Cat's Cradle, and in it, there's a character named Felix Honecker. It's basically in that book, like the literal equivalent to Einstein. And so that's where Felix comes from. Couldn't do anything with Honecker, obviously, because that's like an impossible name to pronounce. People are like, how's that spelled? And then we, in our branding, you'll see a lot of times owls will pop up. And the reason that we chose owls is, okay, a lot of people are going to be using this at work. So owls are intelligent, wise, yeah. sagacious. And so we chose owls. Of course, when we first launched and we had owls, people were like, oh, you chose owls because owls have good vision. And we're like, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. totally fortuitous. Yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. You, just, you, just, you just gained 10 points in my book. <laughs> uh, any, any other favorite books uh, that you like to read? Um, so I think one of my favorite books is uh, this book called Barbarian Days, which is this guy's – it's a it's this guy who wrote for The New Yorker for quite some time, and it's his memoir on his life and surfing. And he kind of traveled the world in like the 90s – backpacking in these surf spots before anyone knew what they were living in these random islands in the, the, you know, in the, you know, near the Philippines and things like that. Um, and you know, Portugal is like big, this big surfing area. Now he was surfing that area before anyone knew what it was. And it's this really cool balance of society and societal pressures and wanting to be successful and wanting to kind of do something in that world. And, 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 more than money or anything, really just have an impact. Mm -hmm. And then kind of living this visceral existence in nature. And I definitely am one of those people who am always kind of trying to find that balance. And I thought that book was really okay, good. Okay, so now going to go stay in a yurt for a week makes perfect sense. Yeah, Tell me yeah. about that. What that First of all, uh, again, talk about where you went. Why did you do that? And that must have been rough. So, so, ever, so th that was actually nicer than some of the other things I've done. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So talk about this one first. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. here the other crazy stuff. So I think it's really important. Um, I try once, one, one week out of the year to be completely off the grid. Um, not like go on vacation and I'm not looking at my phone. It's like, no, I have no access to anything. You must be married. I am married. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been with my wife for, well, we, we got married in September, but I we've been together for 11 years. So okay. I guess that's probably it's starting appealing. It sounds appealing yeah. to, 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 to me right now. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I hope she does not listen. Yeah. No, she, does. she does and she knows uh, I'm joking. Um, so yeah, so I, so, so I think that's really important. And so I try and go and I try and I'm a big skier. And so I try and use skiing as a way of like adventurous travel mm. and to experience like a culture that I never would experience before either. Right. And so this year had kind of a motley crew. I have about 20 people I know that would do these crazy trips. So I'll send out a mass text as I'm planning the next down? one saying who's down. <laughs> so I have this motley crew, a few different people from a few different places and we went out to Kyrgyzstan, which is kind of near like Mongolia. Uh, it's like, it's west of, a little bit west and south of Mongolia. And it's just country of just like 90% mountains. And the mountains are, the snow is really incredible. Also and where you can get kidnapped from. Also where you yeah. can get kidnapped from. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like Tommy Caldwell. Yeah. And, uh, and so we, we got there and we stayed in a yurt for a week. And basically, and we had we had two guides, which was nice because you know when you don't know snowpack conditions and things like that, avalanches are a big concern. Sure. Actually, like a ton of avalanches you could see as we were like climbing up different stuff. Oh wow! So you could see them. You yeah, I mean, like I've done like Abbey courses and things, and you have you know all your gear, and oh, so wow. you're, you're ready for that stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's like it's pretty cool. So you're you kind of use these skis, and then you're you can unclick from your heels, so you can actually. And then you put this thing on the bottom of your skis called skins and that that allows them to to be sticky and so you can walk up instead of and then you take them off and you can ski down and so you know you're going on these things where you might go on a mission to this peak that's a seven hour you know hike up you wow. know between you do that and then finally it gets to be rocky on the you know the summit and you have to you do a scramble for you know call you know a thousand feet or something. Um, so that's really cool. I've done stuff in like winter camping in Yellowstone, lived on a, a boat in Norway for a week, like sailing into like the fjords and skiing up 
you know, going up and skiing down them. And so, is this what you're doing with all our investment money? Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> once a week, once a year, once a year, once a year, once. Is year, this, once, is this once, what all the funding is? No, for? no, no. <laughs> once a year. The nice thing is, he, he hangs up a mind pump. Book the trip. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, the the nice thing is, one is like the team is so awesome and so accommodating to that, and I'm a really big proponent of everyone being able to take off some time to. You know, you work in a startup where you're working 12 hours a day easy. Yeah, yeah. You're going to burn out if you never have an opportunity to just kind of turn off the plug. Yeah. And so it's really important. You know, we have an unlimited vacation policy at FG. And a lot of times that works against the company because the founders are, you know, they're, they're never taking a vacation off. And so everyone kind of looks and goes, well, how can I take a vacation off? What we found is like, if you at the top are like, hey, this is okay. It's okay to take off that week. You're going to come back so much more refreshed, so much more productive. And also you're going to, you're going to want to stay here for longer, right? The most expensive thing is retaining talent. Yep. Right. Totally. If you're going to stay longer, like that is all good business for us anyway. It not only does it build a better culture, but it's good business in the long run. It's going to show up on your PL just the same way it's going to show up in the conversations you have day to day with people. And it's really cool for the team to support me when I get to go off the grid for a week, just like it's really cool when you get to support other people when they get to go off. Um, and so it's it's just a, I think it's a really nice aspect of the field experience. What's culture. the what's the personal value you get out of doing these trips? Like, what, why do you why do you end? I mean, it sounds it sounds fun. I could see how people who are into adventure could would enjoy it, but you must do it for other reasons besides that. I think. Um, I'm a really big proponent of getting into flow states. Ah. And so I think that when I'm skiing, I'm in a flow state. Definitely when I'm skiing down or I'm skiing down something sketchy, I'm in a flow state. But I also find I get into a flow state on the way up. Like everything kind of turns off. I'm not thinking about a lot of stuff. My my body's working really hard. So your mind's not going to be running a mile a minute right. on a ton of different you stuff. Can't. You can't. Um so, you know, a lot of people, you call it skinning. A lot of people talk a lot on the skin track. I'm really quiet. I'm just kind of in my own zone. And I think that when you're in your own zone like that for several days in a row or a week in a row, you just come out with a lot of, you're just a lot of energy, a lot of clarity. Even if you don't realize all the stuff that's going on in the background, like it's kind of going on, but it's not in the forefront. So that's really important. And then I think I'm, I'm a big believer in, in type A fun. So, right, type, there's type A and type B. Type yeah. B is go on a vacation, you've got a Mai yep. Tai, a cocktail, you sit by the beach, read a book. That's awesome. Yeah. But I'm a big proponent in sometimes also not going on a vacation, but going on that adventure, going on that trip and doing that type A fun where, okay, I did, I am exhausted and I am, you know, breathing heavily and I am malnourished at this point because it's <laughs> seven hours and I'm trying to continue to feed myself and you get to the top and you ski down and you look at the pictures two weeks later, like that's really rewarding. Yeah. Were there any big uh, surprises or even like mistakes looking back at the the journey in the business that you think you made? Like, for example, I get asked a question like this all the time and it blew all of our minds uh, how impactful our email list was. And we thought that when we first started, you know, seven, eight years ago that, oh, it's moving away from email. Everything is now moving to, you know, Instagram and Facebook. And as long as we focus there, we're not too worried about that. And that couldn't have, that was probably one of the biggest mistakes we ever made. Um, and it is important is a big portion of our revenue stream. Now, were there things like that, that when you, when you first started, you thought, oh, this wouldn't be a big deal or that's totally surprised you. It's a good question. Um, I think from a, a leadership standpoint, I definitely think, you know, I started this, I was 25, right? Um, I definitely don't think I was the best listener. And so I think I've had to learn a lot about how to listen and understand from where other people are coming from. And I don't, I don't think you can, I can't point like a direct line to how that negatively affected, but mm -hmm. it definitely did, right? We, I think things took longer to happen because instead of, that debate where you're kind of listening to the other side and it's in a respectful discourse, which we now talk a lot about. How can you disagree with someone, but do so in a respectful way? Look out at the end of the day for Felix Gray. I think a lot of people were, if you don't do that the right way, people get, you know, trenched in into their own opinions and things take longer 
than they should. Who is it in your business that's challenging your vision? Like, do you have somebody who is- I think everyone's challenging the vision at all times, not in terms of like the the general direction, but then how do you execute on that? What, how does that manifest itself? And mm. that is good, right? Like I want, I, I don't have all the answers and I don't ever want to be the one to let's look to for all the answers because I'm just one person, right? So when we think about, you know, a new product line, for instance, and we are thinking about something related to like a topical for relief around like neck pain, back pain, mm. stuff like that related to, you know, sitting in posture. And the product we were looking at, I'm like, this is, you know, pretty interesting. And I got a lot of pushback from my, you know, chief brand officer. And she thought that it was a little bit too derivative. She thought that there was other things on the market. And she was right. And now we're working on potentially something different instead that I think is going to be a lot more exciting. And so it's really important, I think, to get pushback on on everything that I say, because as long as you're doing it from a respectful standpoint, as long as you're doing it from, hey, I have Felix Gray's best interest in mind, um, I, I'm going to be open to that. Yeah, I feel like as a leader, if you don't get any of that, you don't know what to trust because then either people are afraid to tell you what their opinion is and they're just mm -hmm. agreeing with you because you're the boss. So you're kind of sitting around. So, so then you become paranoid. like. So then you become like Putin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You literally read my mind. Yeah. Literally read my mind. So, oh, this has been excellent, David. We yeah. appreciate your company. We appreciate what you guys do. One of the reasons why yep. we actually put our money where our mouth is and invest in the company. We don't just work as a sponsor. So, yeah, thanks for. Thanks it's for been coming. awesome to to be on this journey with you guys, and it's it's even cooler to see this next step as we like become closer together and. Uh, it's just been great to be yeah, here. And thanks today. for taking Thank the you. leap into fitness. I, I, a lot of people in the in that space don't realize that the fitness and health space is the perfect place to start, you know, digital wellness. So I appreciate that. For sure. I mean, you guys are focused on improving yourselves all day, every day, right? Just like we are. And I think so. It just makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.